Greetings, everyone, and welcome to God Save the King. I am your host, Tim Kyes. Thank you for listening to God Save the King on the Truth Be Told radio network, where you can hear this show every Friday night at 10 p.m. Eastern. Now, God Save the King is my ongoing 30-plus year biblical, historical, and scientific research project devoted to retelling the, tiv- the nativity the way it really would, ha- would have. Boy, man. I'm off to a great start today. I can't talk. God Save the King is my ongoing 30-plus year biblical, historical, and scientific research project devoted to retelling the nativity the way it really would have happened. And that is because the traditional nativity story is, in fact, Christian mythology and only bears the vaguest resemblance to what really would have happened. Now, of course, there are certain bullet points that remain accurate because our primary source here is the Bible, okay? I am not a skeptic or a agnostic or an atheist or anything like that. I am a mainstream, devout Christian, okay, who believes that the Bible is the inspired word of God, and therefore it is my primary source. But I also put this in historical context. I read lots of history. I do lots of astronomy. Uh, I am big time into archaeology that you're going to find out about in a minute to uh, put this in its context. Because that's one of the problems is that we don't put the nativity story in its historical context. And therefore, we miss things. Uh, that are implied in scripture, but we don't we don't really notice because we don't know the history of what's going on. One of my favorites, I'm already getting off on a rabbit trail. I didn't plan on going here, but we will anyway, is one of my favorites is when we look at the Gospel of Matthew in chapter two, when the wise men from the east arrive, we are told that Herod was greatly troubled and all Jerusalem with him. What does that mean? Okay, well, if you know the historical context, then it's pretty easy to figure out why Herod would be troubled by a visit from these wise men from the East. Now, that's not where I wanted to go on today's show, but it's a great illustration of why we need to study the nativity in its historical context. Okay, so once again, God Save the King, my ongoing 30-plus year biblical, historical, and scientific research project devoted to retelling the nativity the way it really would have happened because the traditional nativity story is Christian mythology and the real nativity only bears the vaguest resemblance to the traditional story. Now, the bullet points that remain the same Yes, Mary and Joseph definitely traveled from Nazareth to Bethlehem. We're going to talk more about that in a second. Yes, the shepherds found a baby in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. Absolutely. Yes, the young child Jesus and his parents were visited by wise men from the east. Yes, Joseph and Mary fled to Egypt to avoid Herod's wrath. Those are all true, but there are details of the traditional story that are just flat out wrong. Sorry. They're just flat out wrong. There's all kinds of stuff about the astronomy that we don't understand and that is misrepresented in the um, traditional story once again. So that's what I'm here to do is to correct some of these things because what we have is we actually have a story that is, number one, it's far bigger in scale. The international implications of what we're, uh, of this story are, are incredible. We're going to talk about that today. And you really have a much deeper story than just this quaint little Joseph and Mary and Mary's on the back of a donkey and there's there's no room in the inn, which that isn't true. He was not born in a motel. He was not born in a stable outside a motel. Jesus was born in a traditional Judean home because that is what scripture indicates. Okay. Now it doesn't say it explicitly, but it strongly implies it because of the Greek words that are used there that do not indicate a traveler's in. They indicate a traditional Judean home. Okay. So anyway, uh, I'm not sure exactly what to title today's episode. Uh, when I was creating the broadcast, 
uh, in the online studio here on StreamYard. I just put in new insights because I do have some new insights that I want to talk about today that are that I'm very excited about because they, once again, it's these kind of details that help us just get amazing insight into the story. Um, and I'm going to share some of those with you today. So let's just jump right in. Um, I mentioned the fact that um, I've come to really love um, archaeology, right? Now, I've never been on a dig. Boy, do I wish I could go on a dig. And as a matter of fact, I found a dig that I would love to go on. It's just that it's. It, I found out too late. It starts next month, okay, in Israel, and they're looking for volunteers. And I just don't think I've got the money or the time off that I could go jump in on this dig. But boy, would I do that in a heartbeat if I was given the opportunity. And the dig that I learned about is in the Valley of Megiddo, okay, in Israel. And it is a dig because they have discovered a Roman fort, okay? They've discovered a Roman fort in the Valley of Megiddo. Now, to put this a little bit in context, this is very interesting, and this isn't really, this is, well, it's just really interesting, so let's go there, right? The Valley of Megiddo is right next to Mount Megiddo, okay? And Mount Megiddo in Hebrew would be pronounced Har Megiddo. So Har Megiddo is where we get the word Armageddon, Armageddon, right? Armageddon is, is, comes from Har Megiddo, the Mount Megiddo, the Valley of Megiddo in northern Israel. Because when you read the eschatological verses that talk about Armageddon, quote unquote, we read that the armies of the earth are gathered at Har Megiddo to invade Jerusalem. There actually isn't a battle at Armageddon. There is no such thing as a battle of Armageddon because no battle actually takes place there. Armageddon, Har Megiddo, is the staging area where the armies of the earth gather to invade Israel. Okay, so isn't it interesting that an army of the earth, the Romans, had a fortress and a permanent camp in the valley of Megiddo. Now, this is indirectly related to God Save the King because the dating of the fort is from the second century AD, okay, after the Bar Kokhba revolt, right? After the Romans put down the Bar Kokhba revolt, they apparently built a permanent fort for the sixth. Roman legion, the Ferrata legion, which in uh, Latin means ironclad. The sixth ironclad legion was garrisoned in the Valley of Megiddo in northern Israel beginning in the mm, early to mid second century AD. Now, this is provocative because we do know, okay, we do know that the sixth Legion, the Sixth Ferrata Legion, was one of what were known as the Syrian legions. There was anywhere between about three and six legions that were garrisoned in Roman Syria, especially beginning right around 40 BC, okay? Because you had the, um, you know, you've got the civil war between Caesar, Julius Caesar, and Pompey that they fought over control of um, Rome. And actually, I could, I could almost back up because the, the first triumvirate, okay, the, the first triumvirate was Pompey and Caesar and Crassus. And what the triumvirate was, was it was a convenient political arrangement by three extraordinarily powerful men in the Roman Republic at that time. At that time, it would have been the Roman Republic designed to keep each other out of each other's hair is, is what it was for, okay? Because any one of them certainly had the power and the ambition to be the sole ruler of the empire, but in order to do that, it would have meant they would have had to have gone to war with their, with these men are in many ways our friends. Pompey and Caesar were were definitely friends, um, 
There's no question about that. And But they did eventually go to war. But the first triumvirate was Pompey and Caesar and Crassus, and Crassus was given the East, quote unquote, the East. Now, the East in Roman terms, according in the Roman Republic, meant anything to the East of Rome, but it also meant to the South. So therefore, that included Egypt. Egypt was considered the East. But what was really considered the East would have been the area uh, that that would have been known as Roman Syria, right? Now, you know me, um, I busted out my map a couple of weeks ago and I've been using that uh, quite a bit. So let's take a second here and see if we can't punch this up on screen so you guys can see it. Take it, take advantage of this opportunity here. And there we go. So this is a map of that part of the world. Now you can't see Rome on this map. You can you can see my uh, my cursor here on the map, right? Where's, come on, can you see my cursor? There it is, there's my cursor, okay? Um, so Rome is actually off the map over this direction, over here, where you can see where my cursor is. Rome is actually off the map in the middle of the Mediterranean, but everything you can see here is to the east of Rome. So that, of course, includes modern Turkey, which have been, which would have been referred to as Asia, Asia Minor, right? And then you have Egypt down here, because Egypt would have been, quote unquote, to the east. And then, of course, they also had their eyes on the Levant. Uh, at the time we're talking about right now, during the time of the first triumvirate, they hadn't quite gotten this far south yet, but they definitely included all this area right here, which would have been uh, greater Syria is what we would have called this greater Syria. So it would include modern Syria, but it would also have included upper Mesopotamia, which is in here. And then, uh, modern, um, Azerbaijan and Armenia, which are in this area up here. So all of this was what was considered, uh, Syria, the East at the time. Okay. So Crassus, according to the first triumvirate, was given control of the East. So he went off to control the East and make money and make war and conquer, you know, cities and nations and stuff like that. And he invaded the East, quote unquote, right? And let's go back there, actually. Let me go back there real quick. Um, do, 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 there. Okay. There we go. That's the one we want. So he invaded the East. He comes across uh, Asia Minor here, and he actually gets to a town right in about here. It is Haran. Okay. Now we've, if you're biblically literate, you've heard of Haran, right? Haran is the city that Abraham traveled to from southern Mesopotamia. When God called Abraham and said, get out of Ur of the Chaldees, Ur is way down here, if you can see my cursor. Ur, Ur is way down here, and he went all the way up here to Haran, which is about right here. The irony is, is he was still in Mesopotamia, okay? Now, that is another story for another time, because God told Abraham to get out of his country, and Abraham didn't get out of his country. He went as far away as he possibly could and yet remained in his country. He was still in Mesopotamia. He did not cross the Euphrates River, which was the key. That's what God wanted him to do was get to the other side of the Euphrates River. Anyway, but so Crassus comes through here and there's this massive battle at Haran where Crassus gets his butt kicked by, guess who? The Parthians. And this is one of the earliest ever encounters between the Romans and the Parthians. Uh, Crassus gets killed as a result, and the Roman standards are captured. And that's a really big deal that, you know, we'll come back to later in our story. But as a result of this, the reason I brought this all up is because Crassus gets killed. That ends the first triumvirate. Now you only have Pompey and Caesar. 
okay, the two most powerful men in the empire. And now Caesar at this point in time is still in Gaul. He's still having his, he's still increasing his wealth by conquering Gaul. And Pompey is back in Rome trying to keep things manageable, right? But eventually they will go to war, the civil war between um, Pompey and Caesar over who will be in charge, okay? And Julius Caesar eventually wins that war and he becomes a de facto dictator. You're not really in the Roman Empire just yet. See, Julius Caesar is actually more of a transitionary character. The first official Roman emperor would have been Augustus, right? But he was nonetheless a de facto dictator or a de facto king because he was the only man in charge, which was something that the, the, the rest of the Roman Republic was very afraid of. They tried really hard to prevent Julius Caesar from becoming a king, quote unquote, right? But then he gets assassinated. And then after he gets assassinated, his heir, which is Octavian, who later became called Augustus, right? And then one of his most predominant uh, generals, uh, Marcus Antonius, they went to war with the assassins, which was primarily... Um, Brutus and Cassius, right? And then they defeated them at a battle in Greece. And that was, I think, in 41 BC, if I remember correctly. And then once that was over, then Antony was given control of the East. So it had been Crassus, right? Then you get the civil war, then you get the assassination, then you get um, what's frankly, what is the, uh, the, the second triumvirate? Is basically what it boils down to. The second triumvirate, therefore, is Octavian and um, Antonius, Marcus Antonius, and then Lepidus. And Lepidus was chosen because both Octavian and uh, Antonius, frankly, trusted him, right? But once again, this triumvirate was a a relationship of political convenience to keep each other out of each other's hair is really what it boils down to. So now Antony is given the East, and what does he do? But he brings several Roman legions to the East because it's his now, right? And it's his to exploit, it's his to conquer, and his to make money off of. And plus, they have been hankering to get back at those evil Parthians for defeating uh, Crassus, and taking the Roman standards. So uh, Marcus Antonius, he's got a burr under his saddle for quite a while that he wants to go after the Parthians, right? So among the legions that he brought to the east was definitely the third Gallic reg uh, legion, uh, Leg Legio uh, Gallica, Right, the third, the third legion, which would have been a legion uh, formed by Caesar, um, and then taken over by Marcus Antonius, and then the sixth Ferrata that we've already mentioned. That was another legion that was brought to the east. But in general terms, these legions were garrisoned much further north than Judea, because we started this out by talking about the fact that the sixth. See, here you go. This is back to the beginning now. Uh, there's an archaeological dig. You, if you just Google, you know, 6th Roman Legion, uh, Megiddo, Israel, archaeology, boom, you'll find it. I forget the name of the organization off the top of my head, but you can uh, volunteer. All you got to do is get to Israel and volunteer, and you can be part of this uh, dig to go uh, excavate this Roman camp. Uh, in northern Israel, but we know that the Ferrata was only garrisoned in Israel beginning, or in Judea, right? The ancient name would have been Judea. Be, they were only garrisoned at that location in the, you know, the, vaguely the mid-2nd century AD. So you're looking at 130 to 150 years after our story. But we know that the 6th was in the region, right? And therefore, did they see activity in Judea? Most likely they did. Now, here's some, some interesting insight. I was uh, doing some extra digging into 
the Roman legions that were in the area. Okay. And one of the things I discovered was uh, I was reading a paper where the guy was crunching the numbers based upon the population of the region versus the, uh, the number of Roman soldiers that would have been in the area. And he estimated that the population of Roman Syria would have been about 4 million. Okay. And that the population or the numbers of the Roman army in the same region would have been about 40,000. In other words, 1%, 1%. And the point that he made that I found provocative was the fact that this meant unless you were living right next to one of their forts or unless they specifically and deliberately had activity in your area, you didn't see Roman soldiers hanging around because they were just, number one, they were just way too few and far between. 1% of the population? I mean, come on. I wish I, wish I had a great... Um, illustration ready for you, it'd be very interesting to find a people group that represents 1% of our population and ask ourselves the rhetorical question, well, how often do you see one, right? You know, pick a job description or something like that that represents 1% of the population. And how often do you see one of those just in everyday activity, right? Now, if there is specific activity going on that requires them to be in your area. Well, that's an entirely different matter. So there were certain times when you probably saw Roman soldiers in Judea because they were called upon to be there for some reason. But in general terms, they were garrisoned uh, much further north. Let's go back to our map here. See, because if you consider the fact that Judea is really down here, and the kingdom of Judea was very small, right? So even if you include Galilee, the kingdom of Judea is only about like this, right? And the nearest, the nearest that a Roman garrison would have likely been uh, garrisoned would have been at Damascus. And Damascus is up right about here, right about where the, the letter O is uh, in the label Lebanon, right? That's about where um, Damascus would have been. But, for example, under Herod the Great, Herod, there might have been some Roman soldiers in and around Damascus, right? Stands to reason that there were, right? Because, but Herod administrated Damascus for the Romans. It was part of his territory that he administrated. So that would have meant it would have been Herod's soldiers, that would have been in Damascus keeping the peace, not necessarily the Romans. And then also by the time you get to our story in particular, there were no major wars in the Roman Empire between about 7 BC and 2 BC, which meant that Emperor Augustus at that time was allowing soldiers to retire, okay? And they established uh, retirement communities, and then also a lot of uh, veterans would just become part of whatever local community that they were in, right? See, like Beirut, Beirut, Lebanon, was a what is a veterans community. So a lot of veterans uh, retired in Beirut, right? Um, but then also you would have had... Um, veterans that would have simply become a part of whatever community they were in, right? So if they were near Damascus or they'd spent any time in Damascus, that they would have just, okay, well, I'm going to make my home in Damascus. Okay, there you go. I'm going to retire here. Plus, you've also got the fact that we, we oftentimes fail to realize that we call it a Roman legion, and it is a Roman army, and it absolutely had a unified Roman culture because of the unified experience of the soldiers, but the soldiers came from all over the empire, right? So when Mark Antony brought these legions to the east, as a matter of fact, the sixth, okay, the sixth Roman legion was at the battle of, um, oh, I, I always get them mixed up. I think it's the battle of Philippi. The battle of Philippi 
was the battle between – it's either the Battle of Philippi or the Battle of Pharsalus. I always get the two of them mixed up. Uh, but one of those was the battle where um, Pompey and Caesar faced each other. Okay, pretty sure that's the Battle of Philippi, I think. No, that's Pharsalus. Pretty sure that's Pharsalus. And then the Battle of Philippi was the battle where the forces, the remnants of Caesar's forces, now under the command of Marcus Antonius and Octavian, defeated Brutus and Cassius. Okay, But the sixth ferrata would have been at both of those battles, as well as the sixth was just beat to a pulp by Octavian at the Battle of Actium, because eventually um, Marcus Antonius and Octavian went to war with each other, and Octavian won. Uh, Antonius was defeated, and the sixth was there, okay, at that battle. So by now, this is so then Octavian, okay, took over the sixth. Now, this is much later, this is 31 BC, but they are at a fraction of their former strength. So now they've got to re be replenished. And where would the replenishments come from? But right in the area where they were garrisoned. So if they were garrisoned here in Roman Syria, then that is where their replenishments would have come from. Okay. So we, we oftentimes lose sight of the fact that a Roman soldier was not necessarily Italian, right? And a Roman soldier almost never was actually from Rome. It was actually very rare that they were from Italy and even more rare that they were from Rome. As a matter of fact, you know, to use a, an example that people might be familiar with, if you watch, you know, the movie Gladiator with, you know, Russell Crowe and um, oh, who's playing the emperor? Uh, Richard Harris, right? Richard Harris is portraying the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, right? They have a conversation because Maximus is referred to as the Spaniard, right? And that makes complete sense because there was lots of activity by Roman legions in Spain, and therefore they would have been replenished by Spanish civilians, right? So, and during that conversation, which is where uh, Marcus Aurelius in the movie, right, offers Maximus, frankly, to become emperor in the place of his son, right? Um, you know, part of the conversation is that Maximus says, well, Rome is the light, you know, and Marcus Aurelius says, but you've never been there. You've never been there. You've never been to Rome. So here is a Roman citizen, right, a general in the Roman army who has He's not from Italy, and he's never been to Rome, and that is actually extremely accurate. So we're looking at the same essential scenario here. It's just that you're talking about ethnic Syrians who would have made up the bulk of the 6th Legion at this point, right, from Anthony forward, because when Anthony brought the 6th to the east, they were already severely diminished in power, at that point in time. And that's like right around 40 BC. Then we know that the sixth is one of the legions that was loaned to Herod for Herod to retake Judea from the Parthians, right? So they would have lost at least some men then, right? I, I know that they were victorious in that battle, right? But they would have replenished again. They're still stationed in Syria. Then um, Marcus Antonius, he this is when he invades Parthia. He invades Parthia in like 37, 36 BC, right? And they get clobbered by the Parthians. They don't even really ever actually fight a battle, right? Uh, Antonius's army gets just destroyed by severe weather, and then they decide to retreat and... Um, and make it back to safe country, and they're harassed by the Parthians the entire way. They never really fought a straight-up battle with the Parthians, but they lost a ridiculous number of their forces. So now here again, they would have had to have been replenished. And then you get, like I said, you get Actium about five years later, and they get 
wrecked again by Octavian. Now they got to replenish again, right? So like I said, you've got this uh, archaeological dig going on in the Valley of Megiddo because we know that the sixth Ferrata was garrisoned there beginning in the middle of the second century AD. But we know that they were in the region beginning as early as about 40 BC. So there undoubtedly was some, I mean, Herod knew who they were. I mean, they were put under Herod's command, right? They were put under Herod's command for about three years. So he would have utilized the sixth, uh, you know, in his battle to retake Judea from the Parthians, right? So you would have had Romans in the area. Um, you probably had some, you know, on business in uh, in Judea. Plus, you know, you have the auxiliaries, right? The auxiliaries uh, had different duties than the legionnaires did, right? So like your cavalry, for example, those were auxiliaries, right? And they had different uh, responsibilities than the legionnaires did. So the fact that there might have been uh, auxiliary troops uh, stationed or garrisoned at Damascus or uh, Caesarea, right? Or maybe even Jerusalem, it's possible. But it wouldn't have been large numbers. And that's kind of important for us to know because by the time that Jesus was crucified, not born, there was probably a much greater Roman presence in Judea. You may have had a, a, a legion garrisoned there by that point. Um, I think there may have even been a legion garrisoned in Jerusalem um, by that point in time. Uh, the tenth, I think, was is the one that was garrisoned. It's either the tenth or the the twelfth that was garrisoned in um, garrisoned in Jerusalem by that time, right? But my point here is that certainly at the birth of Christ, you wouldn't have necessarily had this picture of see when when we when we make movies and tell the story, we're like, well, yeah, there's always a Roman soldier in the background, right? And it's like, mm, probably not. Because number because unless they were there on business, if, you know, if they were there on business, if they had a reason to be there, then that's fair. But if they didn't have a reason to be there, the likelihood that you would have found uh, Roman legions in the area would have been slim, not right in Judea itself. Okay, now that was so that was something that I learned over the past couple of weeks that I thought was really interesting to, you know, our larger story here, because this is this amazing story and conflict, right? Because it's the conflict between Rome and Parthia that sets the background for our story, right? Because as I said, um, so, you know, repeating here, my, repeating myself here, Crassus invades Parthia in 53 BC, gets defeated and the standards get taken, Right. Now, there was some other business that had to get finished first, uh, you know, disputes and civil wars and stuff like that. The war between Pompey and Caesar had to get resolved, right? Before then, uh, what, what happens is, is oh man, I don't, I don't have it in front of me, so I can't give you the minute details, but we, I think you know, it was in last week's episode, we talked about the Magi in their relationship to Herod and the fact that you actually had a civil war in Judea itself over control of the throne between Hyrcanus II and Aristobulus II. And Aristobulus ran off and allied himself with the Parthians. So it was in 40 BC that the Parthians invaded. They actually uh, crossed over the Euphrates and invaded. They took Antioch, okay, which they had never done before. And then they went south into Judea and installed... Um, Aristobulus is king in the place of Hyrcanus, right? So, and that was what caused Herod to flee first to um, Nabatea and then to Egypt and then finally to Rome, where the Romans installed him as king of the king of Judea, right? And then gave him control of these Syrian legions to allow him to retake Judea from the Parthians so that he could actually be. Of Judea. So see, this is the backstory that's behind this. As we started out the show, like I said, um, one of my favorite verses in this whole story is that when the Magi show up, 
Herod was greatly troubled in all Jerusalem with him. Well, why? Why was Herod troubled? Herod was an accomplished military leader. He was good at it. He had, he had his own private army, and he had led Roman legions and driven the Parthians out of the country. Why would he be afraid of three guys on camels? Why in a million years would Herod be afraid of that? Okay, it's, well, it's because it wasn't just three guys on camels. This was an official ambassadorial entourage of Parthian magi whose job it was to install kings. And Herod, he is a client king of the Roman Empire, and the border would have been the Euphrates. So the second that the Parthians crossed the Euphrates and started making their way towards Damascus, right, which we're going to talk about that here in a second. I learned something new about that, so this will be a lot of fun. Um, but the second that would have happened, they would have been in, quote unquote, enemy territory, and they would have been at risk, frankly, of running into Romans, at least at risk of it. Now, the likelihood, once again, we don't know, right? We don't, we don't know the likelihood of them running into Roman legions, but it certainly was very, very possible. It all depends on exactly where the Romans were stationed and exactly where they crossed the Euphrates. That would make a big darn difference as to whether the Romans got alerted to the Parthians' presence. Now, I believe that Herod was alerted to the Parthians' presence no later than when the Parthian um, entourage arrived in Damascus. That no later than that, right? Certainly pushing it certainly no later than when the uh, Parthian entourage arrived in Caesarea because they would have gone through Damascus regardless of which route they took. The chances that they went through Damascus are ridiculously high. And then certainly by the time they went to Damascus, they would have went to um, Caesarea because Caesarea was Herod's administrative capital his administrative capital was not Jerusalem. He spent a lot of time there uh, be, out of necessity, right? Because he at least pretended to be Jewish. So he had to be there during the feasts and things like that. But it was not his administrative capital. Plus, Herod loved spending time at Jericho because in that climate, Jericho was like gorgeous, right? That was his vacation home, his vacation palace was in Jericho. But let's go back to our map here. I want to take a look at this and show you something that I learned that is really interesting because I need a larger scale map. We'll do this again later. If you see, if you follow this line right here, if you follow my cursor and you follow this line right here, this is the Euphrates River Valley right here. All this right here this is the Euphrates River, okay? So the Parthian capital of Stesiphon is right in this area here, right about there. And we're assuming that the bulk of the Parthian army came from here. It does not mean that they did not pick up other um, military units along the way. That's entirely possible because there is a theory. I've mentioned it once or twice before. I think that the Parthian entourage was at about 7,000, right? There is a theory that you also had representatives from the Kushan Empire in India and the Han Dynasty in China. And if that was the case, it probably pushes your army to more like 25,000, okay? I, I haven't yet been able to verify that, so I mention it only as a theory, right? Now, what we know would have happened regardless is that they would have followed, because now this, this, the Silk Road, what we know as the Silk Road is a network of trade routes that goes all throughout this area and further to the east. Now, the Silk Road did not hit its heyday for another thousand years. That's when the Silk Road really came into preeminence with a, was a thousand years later, but Rome and China were already trading at this point. 
Did you hear that? Rome and China were already trading at this point. It's just that most of it was by sea. And, and part of that, and part of the reason why most of it was by sea is because this leg, I'm way over here on the map. I'm way over here on the, on the right side of the map. And that's because this leg, here we go. Check this out. This leg right here from right about here, all the way up to right about here, this leg of the Silk Road was controlled by the Parthians. If you didn't pay the tax, you couldn't get through. But by the time you get up to about here in Uzbekistan, you can see you're not all that far from China. China is like right here. Okay. Now you would have had to gone all the way to the east coast of China to find what was actually considered China at that time. This is modern China. Uh, ancient China was much, much smaller. Um, and therefore, but yeah, this segment of the Silk Road was controlled by the Parthians. So until the Parthians opened that up, there was no possibility of pure um, land travel. And then, like I said, I just realized here that I can move my map. So yeah, there's Italy, right? Italy's way over here. So everything to the east would have been considered you know, the east, right? Okay. So Antony, you know, Crassus initially, and then later Antony as part of the first and second triumvirates would have been given um, some, some parts of Greece, but predominantly Egypt, Asia Minor, and then Roman Syria, right? So, you know, that's a little bit about the, um, you know, the Romans, and then talking about the route that the Magi would have taken, a very interesting discovery that I made uh, recently is that general is that we see we know this we know this from a wide variety of records that the common practice okay was to follow the Euphrates all the way up here all the way up here okay Haran for example is right up about there right where my cursor is that's where Haran is okay so Abraham. Back to Abraham again for a second. Abraham is told to leave Ur of the Chaldees and to go to a land that I will show you. Now, there's, there's a little bit of sorting out that we have to do because when you read the record in Genesis 12, we are told that Abraham was told to get to a land that God would show him. When you read the record in Genesis 11, it's hard to say exactly what happens, but it looks as if Abraham's father, Terah, was told to go to Canaan, right? And look what they didn't do. They did not take off straight across the open desert to go due west because you didn't do that. You would have been going straight across the open desert and it would have been horrible, Okay, you, the, you, the risk of not making it would have been extreme because you would have had to have carried all your own food and all your own water because you would have had no way of picking up any along the way. Okay, so the established method, even as far back as Abraham, was to follow the Euphrates, follow the trade route along the Euphrates because there would have been towns and cities all along the way where you could stop, you could spend the night, you could trade and get food and water and things like that. And then Abraham ends up in Haran, right? And then eventually he drops down into uh, Canaan, right? So we know in general, this would have been the route that the Magi would have taken. And I have been convinced for many, many years that they would have traveled up to right about here, which is where the modern city of al raqqa is um, in Syria, right? And that is where they would have crossed the Euphrates. Um, in um, scripture, it's referred to as Rasafa, Rasafa or Rezeph, okay? Um, and apparently that was a major crossing because various historical records, including the Bible, indicate that a lot of people and a lot of armies crossed the Euphrates at Rasafa. So that's always been my primary, and it probably still is my primary 
uh, hypothesis with regard to which route the um, Magi would have taken. But a lot depends also on the size of the entourage, because if it was Parthian only, right, if it was Parthian only, a much smaller entourage, you know, 7,000 as opposed to 25,000, right, the larger it was, the more important it would have been to um, stay closer to established trade routes where you stood a better opportunity of being able to trade and get food and water. Okay. So the bigger the army, the closer you have to remain to food and water. You don't, you just don't have any option. You don't go flatheading across open desert. You just don't do that. Now, all of that to say that I have discovered that there is an alternate route that they may have taken, which is they would have followed the Euphrates until they got across this border. Now, this is a modern border, okay? But they got would have gotten to like right about here, okay? Not very far, far across the modern Iraqi-Syrian border to a town... Uh, I don't know the modern name of the town, but the ancient name would have been Dura Europos. D-U-R, two words, Dura, D-U-R-A, which means fortress. And then Europos, which is just a reference to uh, Europe, right? A reference to uh, the West, right? And it was named this under Alexander the Great, meaning this was the town that was known as the European Fortress, right? European Fortress. Now, this is interesting because... There was a significant Jewish population at Dura Europos, and there would have been a significant Jewish population at the time we are talking about, right? And then from Dura Europos, there was a well-known, frequently traveled route the, where you would go across the desert. You would beat feet across the desert to Damascus and then about not quite two thirds of the way would have been the town of Palmyra, right? And Palmyra was considered an oasis city, an oasis city. So in other words, they're acknowledging the fact that you are crossing the desert, right? This is, this is not the primary way you would have done this, right? You would have followed the established trade route as much as possible, staying close to food and water. But if for any one of a variety of reasons, you wanted to cut off some miles, you wanted to cut off some distance, or maybe you wanted to remain hidden. Maybe you wanted fewer people to know who you were and what you were doing. Okay, so maybe the Parthian Magi weren't looking to start a fight, right? Which every indication we have is that, no, they weren't. They weren't looking to start a fight with the Romans, but they also weren't stupid. They brought a military escort with them because you just that's what you did, right? For one thing, they uh, the Magi would have traveled uh, in pomp and circumstance, which is what they did. That was how they moved about. They would have brought their families with them. They, they wouldn't have been just lone ambassadors. They would have packed up their families and their children and their servants and uh, the prerequisite uh, necessities to make a journey of this type. See, and then, but maybe, you never know. It's hard to say. So this is just a theory that I'm sharing with you that it's entirely possible that once they hit Dura Europos, that they would have decided to pretty much go due west at that point to Damascus, and then once again, drop down to Caesarea Maritima, Caesarea on the sea, which was Herod's uh, administrative capital, and then finally on down to Jerusalem. But I found that very provocative that this was an, a known alternative route, a known alternative route to going all the way up to Rasafa and then picking up the King's Highway and then dropping down. And the King's Highway, just by the way, the reason it's called the King's Highway is because it went from Rasafa through Antioch, through Amman, Jordan, through Petra, and then down to Aqaba and then across to um, Memphis and Alexandria in Egypt. So it hit uh, a variety of international capitals 
which is why it was known as the King's Highway. So some really interesting stuff there uh, in light of the fact that, you know, we now know a little bit more about which Roman legions were uh, in the area, right? Uh, the sixth Ferrata, the sixth ironclad legion was definitely in the, in the area, uh, may have been garrisoned in Judea at the time of Jesus's birth. Uh, what, and we know for sure was garrisoned at the Valley of Megiddo by the middle of the second century AD. Really interesting that that is a, in a way, is almost a prefigure of uh, Armageddon in that you have a worldly army, army encamped in the Valley of Megiddo. And uh, like I said, if you, if you want to do that kind of thing, uh, look it up on the internet, archaeological dig, uh, Megiddo, Roman Sixth Legion, <laughs> you know, and it starts next month. It starts in May, uh, middle of May through the first week of June. It's like a three-week uh, opportunity to go there and, and dig in the ground and find cool stuff. And man, if I had the money and the time, I would be out of here. I would be going. There's just no question about it to learn more about that kind of stuff. So I really didn't plan on spending the entire episode talking about that, but that's some really provocative, uh, interesting information, some new insights that I have gained in the past couple of weeks. So really happy to share those with you. Um, part of what I wanted to share tonight that we don't have time for, because we're just going to wrap up here in a second, is I wanted to demonstrate how the different factors uh, interact with each other in helping us understand the story. So one of the areas I wanted to go to is I, I wanted to talk about, did Joseph and Mary, when they traveled from Nazareth to Bethlehem, we know that eventually they did go back, okay? Eventually they did go back, but there is a debate amongst those of us that study this material, whether Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem and then went back to Nazareth relatively quickly, and that's the possibility. Now, I don't, I do, to me, this makes no sense. I've worked it over extensively and I just don't see it, right? You've got a bunch of people now who are trying to say that the Magi visited them in Nazareth, not in Bethlehem. Now, that one makes no sense whatsoever, right? Um, but there are people who think that Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem, went back to Nazareth, then went back to Bethlehem, which is where the Magi visited them, right? Then Joseph and Mary went to Egypt, and then they came back to Judea, and then went back to Nazareth for the final time. I don't see it. I don't see that intermediate trip. And we'll discuss this more at length on another episode, but I'll use this to plant the seed and end you with a little bit of a cliffhanger. I think the answer to the question lies in a question, which is, were Joseph and Mary going to Bethlehem only for the registration or were they relocating to Bethlehem or both? Okay, because here's the thing. If you think that they were simply going to Bethlehem for the registration, then it would make sense to at least consider. Not that you have to reach the conclusion because it's not enough evidence to force a conclusion. But if you believe they were going to Bethlehem merely for the registration, then I can see how you would think they went back to Nazareth, okay? Because the scriptural references in Matthew 2 and Luke 2 can be read that way. I don't think that's what they mean. I think that's a misreading of the scripture, okay? But I can see how someone gets that interpretation. But that is based upon thinking that Joseph and Mary pardon me, Mary, Joseph and Mary, Joseph and Miriam, right? Joseph and Miriam traveled to Bethlehem. Or if they were only going there temporarily, then yeah, then they probably might have gone back to Nazareth in between. Maybe. I don't think so, but maybe. Okay. But if they were relocating, if their intention was to move to Bethlehem, which is what I believe was going on, that due to the nature of the registration, 
right? Due to the nature of the registration, also due to the nature of keeping Mary's pregnancy a secret, okay? There is no indication from the Bible. It only comes from the extracurricular documents. There is no indication from the Bible that Mary's pregnancy was publicly discovered in Nazareth, okay? And I absolutely believe that Joseph and Mary planned on moving to Bethlehem because no one was going to know, right? Once they were there, they would have been Joseph and Mary, a married couple, and Mary was pregnant, and no one would have bothered to ask. No one would have known. No one would have bothered to ask or the people that would have known, which would have been extended family, you know, now that they were married, because we know, we do know that they finished their marriage ceremony in Nazareth. Okay. The, uh, the, um, the betrothal happened in Nazareth and the nuptials ha happened in Nazareth. And then they traveled to Bethlehem where Mary gave birth. But I believe that Mary gave birth or pardon me, that they traveled way earlier, way earlier in Mary's pregnancy than anybody realizes. And it was for the reason that they needed to hide it. So they needed to get out of Nazareth while before she was showing, right? Because then they would have been to Bethlehem and no one would have known. Plus the nature of the registration that we'll talk about in another segment, the nature of the registration is that you would have had to have lived OK, you did not register in a town you didn't live in. OK, you would have registered in the town you lived in. So they were moving. They were moving. And we also know that when they got back from Egypt, that they intended to go to Judea. They did not intend to go to Nazareth. They intended to go to Judea. But when they learned that Herod Archelaus uh, ruled in his father's place, then they turned aside and went to Nazareth. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. My name is Tim Kyes. I am the host of God Save the King. I thank you for joining me on the Truth Be Told radio network where you can hear God Save the King every Friday night at 10 p.m. Eastern. Thank you for joining me. We'll see you again next week. God Save the King. <laughs>